By huge majorities, Canadians got vaccinated as early and as often as they could, but a significant fraction of the population doesn't want to, and both sides seem to feel equally hard done by the other. Joining us now on whether it's time to change direction in dealing with the unvaccinated, and as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Vancouver, British Columbia, with Gary Mason. He's the National Affairs Columnist for the Globe and Mail. In Montreal, Quebec, Dr. Christopher Labos, epidemiologist, cardiologist, and a contributor to the Montreal Gazette. In the nation's capital, Rupa Subramanya, columnist at the National Post and Nikkei. And in Ontario's capital city, in North York, Roman Babber. He's the independent MPP for York Centre. And we're delighted to welcome all of you onto our program tonight. Some first-timers here, so we're really delighted to have you all. Let's set up our discussion with a look at some of the latest COVID-19 vaccine uptake in both Canada and the province of Ontario. And these numbers represent people who are eligible for the vaccine, meaning anyone aged five and up. And here we go. Fully 81.7% of eligible Canadians are fully vaccinated and only 11.7% have not received a single dose. And if we look at the province of Ontario in particular, we're a little titch above the national average. 81.8% of the eligible population have received two doses. 12.2% have not been vaccinated at all. The unvaccinated are admittedly a small percentage, but let's remember that still represents several million Canadians. Gary, get us started. How much patience do you still have with the unvaccinated? Uh, very little at this point, I would say. Um, it's, uh, I've, certainly, I've certainly given them time to educate themselves, to uh, be pandered to by governments, uh, offered prizes, offered trips, um, and uh, uh, nothing seems to work. I, I, I think, to be fair, Steve, there, there are sort of two camps within the unvaccinated. I think there are other zealots who will you know, rather die than have the vaccine put in their bodies. There are others who I think are simply maybe hesitant because of, for cultural reasons, or they have been misinformed because of what they've read on um, uh, on social media or on the internet someplace. Uh, so, I mean, there are two camps, but I, I think more generally Canadians are, are, have just kind of had it, you know, with, with this group and they, you know, we, we want to move on. We want to, we, we don't want to read stories anymore about hospital wards being overflowing with, you know, unvaccinated, at least the intensive care units. So I, my patience is uh, pretty much empty at this point. You do make the distinction between the two groups, and we'll come back to that later in our conversation because that is an interesting and important distinction. Rupa, would you follow up on that and ask, and let me ask you whether you think the unvaxxed need to be ostracized by the rest of society? Uh, no, I don't think they, they should, and that's the wrong approach to be taking uh, in a free society as ours. Individuals make choices for themselves consistent with the rule of law while respecting others' rights to, right to do the same. Now, it's a fair argument to make that the unvaccinated create a major negative externality because they suffer more severe disease and they're disproportionately represented in our ICUs. But here's the thing. Other choices routinely lead to hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and perhaps even deaths such as drug abuse, alcohol abuse, heavy smoking, uh, morbid obesity, obesity, yet I don't think anyone serious has suggested that such individuals ought to pay a special tax or a fine, even though these things burden the healthcare system. And also let's keep in mind that Omicron has proven to be highly transmissible and immune escaping. So both the vaccinated and unvaccinated are catching it and transmitting it. Um, I think the unvaccinated are being made a scapegoat convenient scapegoat for other massive failures in the system. Uh, here's one astonishing fact. Uh, there are more than 2,500 people in hospitals across Ontario today who on aver average are waiting for more than three months to get a placement at a long-term care facility. Another 500 or so are waiting for home care. Uh, these folks, through no fault of theirs, are using up scarce hospital resources, including beds, staff, etc. You know, the Prime Minister has weighed in on this from time to time over the last many months, and let's play a clip of him. This is him on a Quebec-based television program discussing the issue of the unvaccinated. Sheldon, the clip, if you would, please. 
Oui, on va s'en sortir de cette pandémie par la vaccination. Puis on, sait, on en connaît tous des gens qui sont en train d'hésiter un petit peu. On va continuer d'essayer de les convaincre. Mais il y a aussi des gens qui sont farouchement opposés à la vaccination. Qui sont extrémistes. Qui ne croient pas dans la science, qui sont souvent misogynes, qui sont souvent racistes aussi. C'est un, 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 une petite, un petit groupe, mais qui prend de la place. Et là, il faut faire un choix en tant que leader, en tant que pays. Est-ce qu'on... Uh, Est-ce qu'on tolère ces gens-là? Yeah, that's the sort of famous racist, misogynist quote that got so much play after the prime minister said it. Roman Babber, let me get you in here at this point. To what extent do you think that the vaccinated people of this country have made the unvaccinated their so-called basket of deplorables, as uh, Hillary Clinton might have put it? Well, the language from the prime minister is very unfortunate. At a time of crises, uh, leaders supposed to uh, demonstrate encourage unity. Uh, unfortunately, the language from the Prime Minister is hateful and very divisive. And in fact, um, I am somewhat perplexed that we're at this place in Canadian history where uh, we demonize an identifiable uh, group of people. It's not warranted uh, by virtue of the science, the progression of the pandemic and, and public policy altogether. Um, I am pro-voluntary vaccination. I'm vaccinated myself. But we have never uh, forced anyone to do anything against their will, uh, nor does there seem to be uh, a strong public policy rationale for uh, mandatory vaccination. We know that uh, Omicron transmits among fully uh, vaccinated individuals. Uh, that's according to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And so the premise behind the passports and the mandates, which is to keep each other safe, uh, is now no longer on the table. As for uh, protecting one's own, uh, I absolutely encourage folks to uh, vaccinate to get the protection that the vaccine offers. But looking at the daily numbers, we see that hospitalizations in Ontario, excluding ICUs, are on par with uh, the vaccinated population. More than 70% of those uh, occupying Ontario's hospitals today are in fact fully vaccinated. And the ICUs are, are about even and, and trending in the vaccinated direction. It's clear now that we are unable to fully exit the pandemic just by virtue of vaccination. What we need to do is we need to stop scapegoating people and, and exhibiting the type of language previously unheard in Canada and focus on building hospital capacity and hospital resources to help us deal with future waves. Let me just do a quick follow-up with you, Roman, though. If the ICU capacity right now is equally shared among the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, and the vaccinated are obviously a significantly larger portion of the population, then we can conclude that the unvaccinated make up a disproportionate amount of ICU beds right now, right? You're absolutely correct. So we have 100, as of yesterday, we had 195 unvaccinated patients in ICU. Surely uh, 200 patients for a province of 15 million people is no reason to redesign our democracy and no reason to get away from the primary objective of the Canada Health Act, which is to facilitate reasonable access to health care without any financial or other barriers. This discussion or, or the proposal to either subject the vaccinated to different rules or, or limit their access to health care or impede their health care in any way, whether by financial uh, requirements or otherwise, is a clear violation of the Canada Health Act, and it will lead us down a very, very slippery slope, uh, whereby essentially Canadians will be precluded from making their own health care choices. All right, Christopher, thanks for your patience and uh, waiting for uh, your turn to get into this thing. And let me let me just follow up on what Rupa had to say and get you to comment on that, because she certainly gave a long litany of what's ailing the healthcare system uh, away from all of this issue of vaccination. So in your view, how much should the unvaccinated be primarily blamed for the situation we find ourselves in right now? Well, so I never like using the term blame because it implies that it's, it's people's fault or that we're attacking them. But I think we can say very clearly that the higher the vaccination rate, go the, the higher the vaccination rate goes, 
the less COVID we have. And I think if you want to look at an example, look at what's happening in, in the U.S. now that, you know, arguably has a more robust healthcare system than we do. Definitely pour more resources into their healthcare system in terms of having larger hospitals, more staff, more equipment. And yet they are also being overwhelmed by COVID right now. So pouring more resources into the healthcare system is obviously important. We need to have we need to resolve a lot of the chronic issues that we've been dealing with, frankly, for the past 20 to 30 years. But we are, I would propose to you, in an arguably better position than the U.S. is right now because we have a higher vaccination rate. And that makes a big difference. It's not the only factor at play. We obviously have to deal with the issues of staffing shortages. We have to have access to testing. But the Omicron variant is just such a significant threat in terms of its increased infectiousness and the fact that it can overwhelm the system that the more unvaccinated people you have, the more people end up in hospital. And at a certain point, you can't keep expanding the hospital system infinitely. You can't, you know, it's very hard to build new hospitals, but it's also very hard to train new staff. So just expanding the healthcare system to accommodate the wave of people who are going to get sick is not a sustainable long-term strategy. Let's do a little comparing and contrasting with what other countries uh, are the kind of approach they're taking to try to get people to vaccinate. And uh, Gary, I'll get you to comment on this first after we go through this list here. Uh, Sheldon, maybe you can bring this graphic up and we'll go through it. In Italy, for example, vaccination will be mandatory for citizens 50 and older with some exemptions, but those who refuse could face fines ranging, ranging from 680 to 1700 Canadian dollars and people could lose their salaries as well. In Greece, they are expecting mandatory vaccination rules for citizens over the age of 60. In Austria, which has one of the lowest vaccination rates in Europe, those over the age of 14 will face compulsory vaccination and fines there could reach almost 10,000 Canadian dollars. Okay, we had a little hint of this in Quebec uh, last week. Gary, in your view, is this an approach we should take here? I think it's a, an approach that we should certainly consider. Um, you know, at some point, people, you know, reach the end of their rope here and, uh, you know, th they demand more action from their governments to get these last holdouts to get vaccinated. You know, one thing that, Steve, I think that that's, needs to be pointed out here, you know, in, in terms of, you know, we don't want to demonize the unvaccinated and, and we don't want to treat them unfairly. And, and but nobody's talking about the hundreds of thousands of surgeries that are being postponed right across this country because ICUs are full up and, and hospitals are full up. I Granted, some of them are with vaccinated people, but those people are in and out in a day or, or a couple of days. It's the ICUs that are really caught a lot of the heartache. There are people with stage four colon cancer who are having their surgeries delayed week after week after week because somebody you know read something on the internet and decided not to get vaccinated and now they're in an ICU. And I think people just see the fundamental unfairness of that and I think, you know, as a Canadian uh, who, you know, is trying to, you know, think of the greater good here, uh, I'm, I'm fully in support of anything that, that forces these people off their couch and into a vaccination clinic and, and finally get, get jabbed. Rupa, can I get your view on that? What about significant fines for those who refuse to be vaccinated? Uh, well, first of all, Steve, I think it's still early days uh, to say uh, to say if ma mandates and fines work. Um, Austria and G Germany, for example, have announced vaccine mandates, but they're still uh, far from being rolled out, and there are already logistical and legal challenges. Uh, and in places like Greece, which has already rolled out its vaccine mandate and fines, um, these decisions are have been very polarizing, and many of these countries have been gripped by protests. Um, also, let's keep in mind that the unvaccinated have already been paying an implicit tax by being denied access to restaurants, theaters, etc. So, if anything, I think this has this has entrenched their opposition uh, to vaccine mandates, either whether you're doing it through the front door or through the back door. And also remember that uh, coronavirus mutates, and therefore the original two dose uh, course is never going to fully protect you for a lifetime. So how does a vaccine mandate work with a carousel of boosters um, that one would have to take? Uh, I mean, it becomes a bit ridiculous after a certain point. And, what, and really, what is the end game here? 
Um, but what has also really puzzled me in the Quebec context is that they haven't mandated vac vaccination, but yet they're going to tax those who haven't been vaccinated. You know, it's a bit like saying it's not mandatory to get a driver's license to drive, but if you choose not to get it, we're still going to uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tax you. So the question here is, why hasn't a vaccine mandate been forthcoming? Um, and I suspect it's because if a province goes ahead and does this, um, um, you know, especially with vaccines that have been approved under emergency orders, uh, which also have had known issues, especially in certain age and demographic groups, it's going to uh, um, uh, elicit a lot of legal challenges and may not survive constitutional scrutiny. You did mention what's the end game here, and I do want to pick up on that with uh, Christopher, because we've been told over and over again the end game is to make sure that enough of us are vaccinated so that we stop putting pressure on our hospitals and our ICUs. In which case, do you think Quebec's on to something when they say we are going to start to find people, they haven't been specific yet, but we're going to start to find people who don't get vaccinated because they're clogging up our hospitals. And as someone else suggested, Gary said it a moment ago, that, I mean, we've got people with stage four colon cancer in this province who can't get a new an ER or an ICU right now. Right. And listen, I think this is definitely an issue that needs to be discussed. And the premier has said this is going to be discussed in the legislative assembly here. Um, it's going to take a while to implement. It actually probably is. We probably don't even have enough time to implement it for the current tax year because tax season is coming up sooner than any of us, I think, would like to ad admit. But I think it's an important issue to discuss because there's sort of two different approaches going forward. One is this health contribution that the premier has talked about. And the other one is to just expand the vaccine passport system in Quebec has also been doing this. They first um, uh, uh, started applying it to liquor stores and cannabis outlets, and now to big box stores. And what we've seen is that every time the government announces an expansion of the vaccine passport system, more people go out and get vaccinated. If you can demonstrate to people a practical benefit as to why they need to get vaccinated to do X, Y, Z, they will go out and do it. So there is this small, hardcore <laughs> of anti-vax sentiment out there. But there are also a lot of people that for a variety of reasons, probably misinformation and, and or, or stuff they've read on the internet, have decided not to get vaccinated because they're not that worried. They think COVID is a mild illness and that it's not something they need to worry about. But if you give them a practical reason to do so, they will. So maybe that's a fine, maybe that's the vaccine uh, passport system. And I think it's important to have this discussion because what we have to do is change the conversation from vaccines about something that it's up to you, your own personal choice to something that is part of the common good in the same way that we've passed anti-smoking laws to you know, limit the exposure to secondhand smoke. We have to start realizing that vaccines have a benefit, not just to you as an individual, but to society as a whole. Roman, I'd like to know what your solution is to the problem of people who refuse to get vaccinated, end up in our ICUs, and as a result, we've heard some of the most egregious examples, uh, people who can't get treatment because the system has had to pivot to take care of COVID-19 patients. What do we do about that? Well, the, the question first and foremost is whether um, the strategy of mandatory vaccination will get us to a desired destination. We know, as I've said earlier, that more than 70% of folks occupying Ontario's hospitals today, ICU excluded, uh, are fully vaccinated. Um, there are about 195 patients in, ICU, in Ontario's ICUs today who are unvaccinated to suggest that that should uh, put the type of pressure on the system where Ontario's uh, healthcare system is unable to survive just speaks to the failure of the system and to the government's failure to ensure adequate capacity and staffing two years later. Uh, as I've said to you a year ago, a lot of our capacity issues are actually artificially uh, caused by acts of government. So for instance, we have uh, suspended not the province, but hospitals and hospital administrators suspended thousands of unvaccinated healthcare workers, despite the fact that they transmit Omicron just like their vaccinated coworkers. We have isolation protocols, very onerous COVID contact and isolation protocols, which artificially uh, decrease capacity by having uh, healthy workers sit at home. We have Bill 124, which caps uh, pay increases for nurses at 1%, which is 3 to 4% below the rate of inflation. But we are doing everything, the Ontario government doing everything possible to discourage capacity. But what we tend to do instead in the last two years is 
assign blame, whether it's uh, folks that uh, hold the Canadian flag outside of Queen's Park outdoors, even though their province cannot show a single case of outbreak outdoors, or it's uh, folks that want to have a car parade in Wasaga Beach, uh, or Adamson Barbecue who wants to sell brisket, even though small business is not responsible for the spread. We tend to blame everyone but ourselves. What we need to focus on is the fact that this is a very transmissible virus, and we need to make sure that we built enough healthcare capacity and staffing capacity to deal with whatever comes, and that hasn't happened. Let's go back to uh, something Gary referred to in his very first answer, which is the notion that there are really two different categories of people we're talking about here. And to that end, I want to get a better sense of who the vaccine hesitant are, as opposed to the out-and-out anti-vax conspiracy types. Abacus data pulled thousands of unvaccinated people, and here are some of the responses they came up with. Uh, th this may surprise you. They have an average age of 42 years old. 59% of the vaccine hesitant are women. Approximately 66% say they've got a post-secondary education degree. More than 60% say they sit at the center of the political spectrum. 35% vote Liberal, 25% Tory, 17% New Democrat. Now, let's flip that over and look at the intense anti-vaxxers. These are the people who are not going to take it under any condition. COVID is a hoax or exaggerated. 34% of hesitants agree with that, but 73% of staunch anti-vaxxers agree with that. How about the question of they hate government telling them what to do? 85% of vaccine-hesitant people say yes to that. 90% of anti-vaxxers say that. And meantime, 17% of vaccine-hesitant people say they don't trust their doctors. That's why they're not getting it. 40% of anti-vaxxers say they don't trust their doctors, and that's why they're not getting it. Uh, let's start with this. Gary, do we have the right people in mind when we talk about an unvaccinated person? Uh, boy, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I've always believed that the unvaccinated, you know, it was a, a plethora of, you know, society. It was it was a wide range of people. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, we should be targeting specific groups. I, I just know, Steve, that, you know, the, we have, what, 10 percent of the population roughly in Canada that is unvaccinated now. It, it was a lot larger you know, uh, not that long ago, you know, it was probably 20 percent, 30 percent. Various provincial governments across the country brought in vaccine mandates that kind of, you know, tighten the screws on people and, and, and you know, gave them a choice. Get vaccinated or you're not going to have the right to work. You're not going to have the right to go to a restaurant. And it did. <laughs> it did significantly impact the uptake in, in vaccinations. Uh, so it, vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, all those measures work. Now, quickly, there's going to be a segment of the unvaxxed, you know, the people that are showing up in front of uh, politicians' homes at all hours of the day with, with picket signs and, and, you know, talking about, you know, Nuremberg trials and sending threatening notes to journalists. You know, you know they're, they're going to die. They, they'll die before they have a vaccine put in their body. I, I'd say, you know, we're never going to convince them. But, you know, there are others that we can still reach. But it's not going to be through nice talk and gentle persuasion and let's, you know, get them into therapy. I mean, we don't have the time to do that. Like a pandemic affects all of us. It affects all society. It's not like we're not talking about smokers or somebody who drinks too much. I mean, those comparisons are absolutely silly to make them. This is a once in 100 years pandemic. It takes, you know, in, in it necessitates extraordinary measures. This is extraordinary times. And people have to get that through their heads. A lot of the people are saying hands off to the unvaccinated are sitting in their comfy homes. Their, their life hasn't really been affected much by it. They don't have a loved one who hasn't had a surgery because of this. So, I mean, I think people have to get a grip here. This is serious. And, you know, it's gone on long enough. Rupa, what about that notion that this is a once in a century phenomenon and the majority have to be prepared, or I guess in this case, a small minority have to be prepared to forego some of the civil rights they might normally enjoy so that the vast majority of people can feel safer? 
Uh, yeah, I, d I completely disagree with that, Steve. Uh, as, you know, from your from your reading of the stats, uh, it's very clear that the unvaccinated are not a monolith. Uh, they include everyone from those who have requ recovered from a prior infection to professional athletes to your next door neighbor who votes liberal and shops at Whole Foods uh, and wants to control what's going into their body. It also includes people who come to Canada fleeing despotic regimes uh, and have a personal and collective memory of the harmful effects of government mandates, such as indigenous people, immigrants from uh, former communist countries, or uh, people who fled war zones, where you know if the government tells you to do something, you're immediately suspicious. Um, let's also keep in mind we're missing an important point here, which is that the vaccines that, that are currently in use have been issued under emergency orders have had some well-documented issues. So you've had blood clots with AstraZeneca, some young people have had heart issues by taking Moderna and Pfizer, and these are not conspiracy theories. I think there's a more general Ruben, point you'll here, acknowledge, though, that, that's, that, a, that's an awfully small, tiny percentage of people who've been affected in this way. It, Overwhelmingly, the vaccination it, program's been a success, right? It is. It is. I took the AstraZeneca, by the way, so uh, it, it, I, I fully agree with you, but it's enough to spook quite a number of people out there. Uh, the, a more general point here is that if you if you distrust uh, the government and big pharma especially, and you're told you'll be taxed or otherwise sanctioned uh, if you don't get vaccinated, it's only going to entrench your opposition to vaccines, especially if they're mandated. Well, we do know that is true. That uh, that has been empirically proven. Uh, Christopher, come on in here yeah. and tell me whether you think it's important to make a distinction between those who are still, let's call them hesitant, but potentially open to getting vaccinated versus those for whom this is a non-starter. No, I think you are absolutely correct. We have to make that distinction because those people can be motivated. Unfortunately, though, I don't think asking nicely is going to be enough of that motivating factor. We can address some of the miss uh, truths that they've heard. I've frankly heard a few of them on the program right now. So the idea of emergency use authorization, that is not a Canadian thing. That is something the FDA did temporarily, which has since been changed. They have gotten full approval in the US. Emergency use authorization is not a Canadian designation. That does not apply in Canada. They got full Health Canada approval. The other thing, the idea that the vaccinated people can still transmit the virus as easily as the unvaccinated, that too is untrue. Um, yes, you can still get sick if you are vaccinated and then transmit the virus to somebody else, but you're much less likely to do so if you're vaccinated in the same way that you're less likely to get sick and end up in hospital. So we can combat these statements and try to reassure people when they've heard things that are potentially scary. But a lot of people are not going to be moved simply by information because, frankly, they don't watch the news. They're not watching this program right now. They're getting misinformation from the Internet. So in the same way, you can educate people about the dangers of drunk driving. Unless you put police on the road to set up roadblocks and give people breathalyzers, you're not going to completely eliminate the issue. So there has to be some form of inducement to doing the right thing. And whether it's the passport or a tax or something else. We just have to change the way we talk about vaccines rather so that it's not simply a you get to decide what to do. We have to change it to be something that is mandatory. And by mandatory, I don't mean that people are going to come and forcibly vaccinate you. By mandatory, I mean making it something that everybody has to do and that there are some consequences if you don't do it, like not wearing your seatbelt when you drive a car. The police don't come and buckle you into your car, but they write you a ticket if you don't wear your seatbelt. So we have to start reshaping our thinking in that sort of way. Roman, let me get you to comment on what I think has been one of the more interesting political developments at Queen's Park over the past year, and that's you. Um, part of what uh, interests me is the fact that you have been, and you've said it again today, you've been vaccinated. You you are following the rules and getting yourself vaccinated. You think it's the right and healthy choice to make. And yet for, you know, for a variety of interesting reasons, you've become a bit of a champion of the unvaxxed. Um, you know, the people that Doug Ford calls those yahoos on the South Lawn of Queens Park who don't seem to want to follow any rules at all. Um I'm not even sure what the question is here, other than maybe that, are, are you comfortable being the champion of the unvaxxed in the way that you've become? I'm comfortable being a champion for all Ontarians who do not have a voice. And regretfully- That's what, not what, what I asked you though, like Roman. I asked you whether you're comfortable being a champion of not just the vaccine hesitant, but the out and out conspiracy people, the anti-vaxxers, they like you. Well, you just cited an abacus study that suggested that the hesitant 
are on average a 42 year old female with post-secondary education who votes liberal. So I, I would not necessarily categorize uh, anyone with a preconceived notion. What I am opposed to, however, is forcing anyone to do anything against their will. What we've seen in the last couple of months is this drive to uh, prevent uh, folks that made a different medical choice from enjoying uh, normal access to daily life, whether it's public transportation, trains or planes, or uh, forcing someone to choose between uh, their own healthcare choice, and we still agree that it's a choice, uh, versus uh, putting food on the table, which is why I brought the jobs and jabs bill. I felt uh, always, whether it's children with autism or uh, Canadians that do not have access to their loved ones in long-term care home, that throughout this pandemic, we've been missing the point. Uh, public health has been wrong time and time again. And any suggestion that vaccinating the balance of the 10% will get us out of the pandemic uh, is not uh, grounded in any reality. Public health told us that we're going to exit as soon as we're at 70%, 80%. We're now at 90% almost of eligible Ontarians. And here we are back in lockdown. Uh, passports and mandates didn't work because the places that they were supposed to safeguard are now in lockdown, such as restaurants or gyms, and that spread was not prevented. My focus has always been on demanding better service from government. Government has failed to build hospital capacity, and it is artificially choking hospital capacity. That's the reason we're canceling surgeries. We need to hire back all staff that was let go. We need to end the uh, onerous... They were let go because they wouldn't get vaccinated. Protocols, yeah, and they we need to compensate hang on, hang on, nurses Roman, appropriately. They, they were let go because they wouldn't get vaccinated. Do you think it's a problem for people who work in the healthcare system providing services that we need not to be vaccinated? Well, we know that uh, Quebec has now U-turned on this. We know that the Ontario government is considering uh, bringing back unvaccinated workers. And in fact, Dr. Isaac Bogosh uh, himself a couple of days ago called for the return of unvaccinated workers. Uh, we understand very clearly from the chief medical officer that Omicron transmits among fully vaccinated individuals. We know that the first two shots are probably have a limited effect in preventing uh, Omicron transmission. We see a recent study from public health, supported by Public Health Ontario, that suggested that the booster has limited effect on preventing transmission. And so if- uh, But it has a strong effect in keeping you out of the worker. ICU. It has a, okay, it has a strong talking, effect in keeping you out of the we're ICU. Talking, so we're talking about two elements here. One is the element of transmission. If we're worried about transmission to other people, then that argument is off the table because transmission seems to be similar between, uh, at least according to the chief medical officer now, uh, between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, that of Omicron. When we talk about burdening the healthcare system, that is a, a different argument. But then we get into the question of, well, do we now deviate from the principles of Canada Health Act and create okay, barriers? Okay, I get your point. You've made that point. I'm down to my last five minutes. Gary, you've heard what Roman had to say. I wonder if you'd come back and uh, retort that if you choose to. Well, I mean, I, I think that the only thing I would say is, uh, I think this notion that we have to build capacity to handle the situation that we're in now is ridiculous. I mean, this is a one in 100 year pandemic that has forced hospitals, you know, uh, to be burdened like it, they haven't been burdened in, you know, years and, you know, in, in a long, long time. Look, at our hospital system needs fixing. There's no question about it. There, it needs improving. We, ne we do need to hire more nurses, more doctors. No question about that. But this idea idea that we need to build capacity to handle a pandemic is, is just, it's ridiculous. There's lots of things that we need to do, but I don't think that we need to, you know, add thousands and thousands of beds in the event that we have another pandemic down the road. Uh, I, I think, you know, Steve, to, to just sort of summarize my feelings on this, you know, the government's responsibility is to the greater good. And if it means ostracizing, or if this means having a negative effect on a small group of people, to protect the greater good, I think most Canadians, a vast majority of Canadians, would see that as a right-headed policy and, and something that they would support the government to do. And that's what's happening now. We, we do have to simply uh, force, put the pressure on unvaccinated to, to, to go in and, and, and get a jab. There's just no other option. We just can't just keep hands-off approach. We just can't keep doing that. 
No, I appreciate your position, but but of course, uh, you know, there is such a thing as the tyranny of the majority, and we do have something called minority rights in this country, and that's mm -hmm. what the charter is all about. Uh, right. So, you know, I guess, Rupa, I want to ask you, I think the first people in the province of Ontario got vaccinated 13 months ago. Everybody's heard the arguments about why you should or why you might not want to be vaccinated. Is there any, I mean, we've tried lotteries, we've tried, you know, potentially uh, preventing you from going into uh, arenas or stadiums or, you know, restaurants and bars and all of this. I is there anything anybody can say at this point, Rupa, in your view, that would make somebody who hasn't been vaccinated yet say, oh, the light goes on. I think I'm going to go out and get my jab now. Um, I think, Steve, at this point, if you're unvaccinated, despite all of those horrific videos of people winding up in the ICUs and, and you, you still don't want to get uh, uh, vaccinated, I don't think anything's going to change your mind at this point. But I still believe an approach based on carrots rather than sticks makes way more sense. Uh, for one thing, we don't recognize recovery from prior infection prior infection, unlike other countries, uh, when acquired immunity is as old as uh, time itself. Um, in addition, I would say that there's been a massive failure in messaging from our experts and public health officials. In some cases, it's been downright damaging. Um, a, a few weeks ago, a prominent expert said vaccine effectiveness was melting like snow. And then a few weeks later, he had to backtrack and say, say that even two doses of the vaccine is good at preventing severe disease. So what kind of signal does this send to the unvaccinated? Um, more generally, I feel that there's been a fair bit of fear mongering, which basically says that the sky is falling. Uh, even for those of us who are vaccinated and boosted, boosted like myself, we're back to the restrictions we had in the spring of 2020 and staring at a future uh, of frequent boosters and perhaps more restrictions. So when even the vaccinated are confused and fed up, Im imagine what the unvaccinated are, are saying. I'll tell you what they're saying. They're saying, why did these folks get a vaccine if they end up getting COVID? And they're also ending up in hospitals and ICUs and face the same restrictions as us. Uh, you know, for the vaccinated, social life has once again disappeared. Uh, we're, we're back to restrictions. We're not meeting friends uh, because we're, uh, they're, they're fearful of getting COVID. So sure, if you're vaxxed and boosted, chances are severe illness has lessened. Uh, but then you're still a prisoner of uh, the restrictions. And that's not much of a life, is it? Christopher, can I get you to weigh in on this issue? We've heard just about every argument in the book for the last 13 months on why we should be vaccinated. Do you think there's anything that could still be said that could convince somebody who's vaccine hesitant to get the jab? Potentially, yes. I've had a few one-on-one -on -one experiences, but it's because these people have really bought into the misinformation that's out there. I've had so many people, so many young women uh, speak to me about not getting vaccinated because they're worried about infertility. And this is just the, this is just one of these myths that just keeps coming back, keeps coming back, keeps coming back. Aaron Rodgers cited it as the reason why you didn't want to get vaccinated. So it's very hard to combat this stuff. You can eventually do it, but it's an incredibly labor intensive approach. So it is feasible, but it's not going to work on a broad scale in the same way that if you want people to quit smoking, you know what you do? You pass anti-smoking laws. And does that restrict people's freedoms? Yeah, a little bit, but it makes society healthier. And over time, the the feeling of the population changes. Passing anti smoking. That's the key though, laws, Christopher. The key is yeah. with the smoking with the anti smoking legislation, it kind of took twenty years before we yeah. finally got to a position where smoking was considered really antisocial and people weren't gonna put yeah. up with it. We don't have twenty years here, do we? No, we don't. And my hope is that the population learns from the past experiences and that we acknowledge that vaccines are a very helpful strategy. I understand that people don't like the idea of the government telling them what to do, but you know, try to remember the old adage that your freedom to swing your fists ends where my nose begins. The invocation <laughs> of personal liberty can't be used if your actions cause harm to others in the same way that you can't use freedom of speech to incite other people to violence. So we have to have a serious conversation about whether vaccines are a, are a, a public good or an individual medical choice. And I would put the case to you and to everybody that they are a public good. And in the same way that you have to give your children vaccines to attend school in Ontario, we have to make the decision about whether you need to get vaccinated in order to participate in public life. I'm really grateful to the four of you for participating in this discussion. I got 10 seconds left to ask Roman Baber, who's an independent member of the Ontario legislature. Are you running for re-election in June? 
It's a decision that we'll make over the next couple of weeks. You're going to give me a call and let me know when you decide? Um, happy to speak to you anytime, Steve. Good stuff. <laughs> Gary Mason from the Globe and Mail, Dr. Christopher Labos from the Montreal Gazette, the epidemiologist and cardiologist, Rupa Subramanya, columnist at the National Post and Nikkei, Roman Babber, the MPP for York Center. Thanks all of you for being on TVO tonight. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.